as a host, I can switch off the video. So, anything at all? So, I can't just switch off the video and switch it on. Are you right? Yeah. How do you do I'm from Sunday. I'm from Delhi. Uh, did my BSc and came here after BSc. In Delhi. In Delhi, Delhi University. Um, Delhi University. And came here after BSc for an integration program. Integration program. Yeah, I work on how signal is transmitted from, from one cell to the other, one neuron cell to the other, or or you can say how endocytic cargo is formed in one particularly, but. Sure, I have a tiny slide on that. I put it in. I hope the other comments are missed. Hmm? I hope the other comments are missed. Yeah, yeah, I put as many I could accommodate, I did. Chat. Is the audio? When I'm gone. Get your laptop now. What time is it? Did I say, you know, he's asking when do we start? Yeah, sure. Who is Satyarth? You are messaging me privately. I will sit here and <laughs> not show my face for a while. It is too bad. I will not respond to this. I know it is, it is random people messaging. I am so excited. Why? Yeah, no. I will unmute it. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Uh, just show yourself. Uh, we are audible, right? And Some... unmute yourself. It is unmuted. Okay, I won't be there on Zoom, but that's okay. Uh, hello, and welcome to yet another Chai and Y, which is online during the lockdown thanks to COVID 19. Uh, today, we're going to have Shravanti. Whom I hope you can see on your screen somewhere on a corner. Maybe you can uh, can you just temporarily make your screen big or something? I can do that. Uh, Hi. 
yeah, that's Shravanti at the corner of your screen. And uh, she did her bachelor's at Delhi University and then came to TIFR for an integrated PhD, where she works on how signaling happens in tiny worms. And part of it, of course, is to understand how stuff goes inside cells. And that's the topic for today. So over to Shravanti. Hi, everyone. Uh... Today's topic uh, for Chayan Vai will con uh, will, uh, will is aimed to look at mechanisms that uh, different particles or molecules or other kinds of organisms use to ac get access into the cells. So I hope everybody remembers this textbook image of a cell. This is uh, a typical animal cell which has several compartments within it. So you can imagine cell as a live factory that works 24 seven to uh, produce and deliver multiple cargo or items, you can say. So like a, like a factory, the cell also needs to interact with, uh, within itself, like several departments of the factory need to interact with one another to communicate effectively to form the right kind of material that needs to be produced. Uh, they, uh, similarly, the different compartments in the cell are specialized uh, for different purposes and they communicate with one another to uh, meet the needs of the cell. Additionally, like much like a factory, uh, the cell also needs to communicate with the exterior because the main purpose of a factory is to get goods out for whoever wants it. So it is like a service that the factory provides, which is like the cell, uh, which is similar to the cell communicating with other things around it, trying to sense the environment and trying to, you know, cross talk with it. Similarly, the material for the factory also comes in uh, from outside. So the outsides of the uh, of the factory need to also be in communication with the cell. Similarly, the cell also uh, needs to you know, communicate back and forth. So this kind of communication is very dynamic and it happens in multiple ways. So you can see that. Uh, Are you unmuted? Are you muted? Sure you're not muted. No, I'm unmuted. Yeah. Yeah. The speaker is off. My speaker is off now. Thank you. Um, okay, sorry for this. Okay, so I was saying, as I was saying, there are multiple compartments within the cell, much like the different divisions of a factory. For instance, you can see here uh, that there are uh, there is this uh, orange thingy, which is called the Golgi complex. What Golgi complex does is take the material that comes from other organ, uh, uh, other uh, org, uh, compartment which is called the endoplasmic reticulum and form different kinds of proteins so you can think of golgi as a post office or a hub or essentially a hub in the factory which you know takes all the so, uh, takes all the material and then says oh no these material are for this kind of product so it will be sent to say mitochondria and this material is for some other kind of um, machine so they'll probably target it to lysosomes so I hope you guys know what these things are. Mitochondria, I think everybody knows, is the powerhouse of the cell. So the primary function of mitochondria is to provide energy. So it is like the fuel which drives all the machines, which are the different other compartments that are formed, that uh, function in the cell. Okay. So one of the so all of these compartments have different functions. With it, you uh, and one of the most important compartment, uh, which doesn't look like a compartment, is the outer layer of the cell. This is called the plasma membrane. So if you zoom in, uh, so if you go back here, and if you zoom in, if this, if you zoom into this part of the plasma membrane, the cross section, if you look at this area, if you zoom into this, cut it and zoom into that area, you can see something like this. This is very highly zoomed in. And you can see this is the interior of the cell, and this is the plasma membrane, and this is the exterior of the cell. So you can see that plasma membrane is actually a covering and it contains of several different kinds of things. Okay, so what you see are these globular things, which are actually called proteins. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the term proteins. And you can also see there are these green spiky things which are jutting out. They are uh, forms of carbohydrates and sugars, which are much more simple, uh, which are much more simpler than the ones we are used to or hear of uh, in our daily life. So what is the purpose of these things? So the plasma membrane is the is the layer that actually enables the communication of the cell with its exterior. So these proteins that are present in the plasma membrane and these uh, uh, sugar and carbohydrate mo uh, molecules, which are jutting out of the plasma membrane, they act as sensors for anything that is present outside the membrane. 
So these receive or sense the signal and they uh, try to communicate that, try to communicate whatever they sense outside to the interior of the cell, which essentially means that these things are like the door or the locks to the cell. So if you have anything that can open these, uh, that, uh, that can fit into these locks and open them, they can actually get access to the interior of the cell. So these are the locks for the cell, which will, uh, you know, restrict or enable entry into the cell. Okay, so now you know that, uh, so you will know that a cell is very tiny, right? And it has a limited space. So if all the molecules on the cell, uh, on the surface of the cell are suppose occupied, so that will not do well for either the exterior or the cell. So that must mean the molecules that are occupied will only stay occupied for a certain amount of time. And after they're occupied, they have to be freed. So the molecules that are occupied will gain access entry into the cell. So these molecule, so once an external molecule will come and bind the green part or the protein part, all of them will gain access into the cell. So that entire protein is disappeared. So if, if such a process is to take place, soon there will be no protein or carbohydrate left on the plasma membrane. So that, that means that you have to maintain the plasma membrane and you have to you know, recycle these. You have to keep uh, empty locks on the plasma membrane to enable more keys to bind to them. So one of the process through which you know, uh, the transport or material is new material that is made, new locks that are made onto the plasma membrane are sent to the plasma membrane is called exocytosis. So uh, what exo means is outside and cyto means cell. So exocytosis is a process in which interior th uh, things which are made inside of the cell are transported to the external, external part of the cell. So as I've told you previously, that there are several kinds of organelles or compartments in the cell, for instance, endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi complex. These two, com these two compartments form different proteins and it is at the Golgi complex that different proteins are targeted and so uh, sent to different other compartments in the cell. So one of the kinds of proteins that the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi complex form and distribute in the cell are the, are the proteins that are required or to be present on the plasma membrane to actually sense what is happening outside. So let us look at this process of exocytosis. We will look at only this arm right now. So you will have some material which is made in the endoplasmic reticulum. It is transported in these tiny compartments, which are called vesicles, and it goes to the Golgi complex. So I mean, most many of the proteins that are made in the endoplasmic reticulum will go to the Golgi complex. So now, as I've told you, Golgi complex is a place where it sorts and, and says, no, you are protein A, you go to plasma membrane, protein B goes to mitochondria, protein C goes to lysosome, etc. So all the proteins that are destined for plasma membrane will be sorted separately and will be put into further vesicles, which are also the tiny compartments, and eventually transported through the plasma membrane, where the vesicle finally will merge with the membrane, or merge with the plasma membrane, Essentially, what happens is that this vesicle will create a slight tiny nick in the plasma membrane. If this is the plasma membrane, the vesicle will come, it will open and it will merge with it and to release the contents outside. And whatever is present with it will form the part of a plasma membrane. So this sounds very nice, but if you have a pathway, suppose you have only exocytosis happening and you have a continuous flow of materials such as plasma membrane components to the cell, to the cell exterior or to the cell plasma membrane, what is the thing you will expect? The most obvious thing that you will expect is that the cell continues to grow. That the, as and when the material keeps depositing, the cell will continue to grow. So then you and I will not be in our shapes. Then all of us will occupy infinite amount of spaces because all the, all the cells of our body will continue to grow seamlessly. So there is another counter mechanism in the cell to prevent the infinite growth of a cell wherein it is called endocytosis. What does endo mean inside? It is the opposite, exact opposite of exocytosis. Endo means inside and cyto is a cell. So endocytosis is the process by which things are internalized into the cell. So you can see that, so this is the process through which all of those molecules, all of those proteins that get occupied because other molecules bind to them outside the plasma membrane, all of them are taken inside the cell through this process 
and they are transported to different regions. So let us look a little more carefully at endocytosis. So here you will see that uh, in both in endocytosis, you will see that the plasma membrane is actually opposite. Now you will have plasma membrane and this will form something like this, something like a bud, a vesicle. Uh, oh, okay. So, so when you have, uh, so initially what we saw for exocytosis was you had a membrane and you create a nick in the membrane and then you add more membrane to it so as to expand it. But if you have endocytosis, you will have to fold the membrane in and then you will uh, then eventually form, oh sorry, uh, these kinds of pockets which are a result of folding of the membrane inwards. So you actually take that in. And so this is a pocket, which is also another kind of vesicle, you can call it. And then these contents will be delivered to different other compartments. So as we spoke about exocytosis, wherein stuff for uh, stuff to be exocytosis, exocytosed or thrown out or thrown, uh, taken to the plasma membrane comes from either endoplasmic reticulum or Golgi complex or both or many other things, which I'm not showing, and many other places, which I'm not showing here. Similarly, the stuff that is internalized or taken in by the cell will also be take will also be taken to different uh, uh, regions. You can call them as depots in the inside the cell. The first immediate uh, place that anything that is internalized in the cell is taken to is called an early endosome because it's the first one that you encounter. So it's early, the first one that you encounter. Eventually, it can go to late endosomes and graft to Golgi or wherever it wants from the endosome. Okay, so this pathway seems very crucial because as I've told you that this endocytosis and exocytosis pathway not only helps you to communicate with the exterior of the cell, it also uh, seems to do a lot more things li like sense the external environment and maintain the cell shape and size. So uh, because of the seminal contributions of these three gentlemen in their uh, uh, for in, in the field of understanding and discovery of these pathways, uh, uh, discovery of molecules that regulate these pathways, James Rothman, Randy Sheckman, and Thomas Sudoff got Nobel Prizes in 2013. So what uh, Randy Sheckman contributed was the different uh, molecules that enable the transport of these endosome or other vesicles within the cell. He identified different kinds of uh, proteins that make these transitions smoother make these trans uh, make these transitions happen and uh, and in a very coordinated and regulated manner inside the cell what what james rossman also found was very similar but he took very different kinds of approaches from randy sheckman and he did it also in a different kind of cell randy sheckman found out this mechanism in yeast cell whereas james rossman found out these mechanisms in a different way in in mammalian cells which we are all mammals also so this was the importance of both of their work is that these pathways, these, these kinds of mechanisms are happening in all kinds of cells, starting from as small as a yeast cell to as mature and as complicated as a mammalian cell. So uh, what is the contribution of Tom Sudoff, you may ask? So Thomas Sudoff was actually interested in looking at neurons. So neurons are the cells of the brain. And what neurons do are communicate information from one neuron to the other or one neuron to other cell which is like a muscle or any other cell. So one of the ways in which a neuron communicates is by releasing chemical uh, molecules into uh, to the cell exterior, which are sensed by the following cell, which can either be a neuron or any other kind of a cell, say a muscle. So Thomas Sudoff was actually looking at uh, how the neuron releases these chemicals. And he was actually looking at the process similar to exocytosis of the vesicle which contains uh, the information for communication between neurons. So taken together, all of their work essentially uh, highlighted or uncovered several important steps in this entire endocytic and endoexocytic pathways. OK, so now we know that this is important. This is important because this, is, this does a lot to uh, help the cell function, help the cell communicate and help the cell, you know, make more material and deal with dead material. Okay. So one another important, another important uh, 
use for endocytosis and exocytosis, which evolved over time, is that through these mechanisms, the cell can also uh, take in nutrients, which is not surprising because if it's interacting with the external environment, you would assume that one of the requirements is to get nutrients. So any nutrients that are present in the external surface will be uh, uh, are taken up through the process can be taken up to the process of endocytosis and they are eventually you know transported from the endocytic vesicle to the early endosome to other to other compartments in the cell and similarly anything that the external environment needs from the cell the cell will make in the uh, in different parts and it will deliver outside so this seems like a very easy mechanism and because and it's a, it's a very tightly regulated mechanism and it seems like this is a mechanism which one can use you know it's like a hotel if you want to go in and if you want to use the facilities you can use the facilities and whenever you want you can check out so which is exactly how different kinds of pathogens think of these kind of mechanisms so a lot of bacteria and viruses actually hijack this mechanism to enter into the cells and then they use this and they use the cellular machinery to make more of them the viruses especially and then they eventually use the exocytic machinery to get out of the cell. Okay, so with this in mind, let's talk about the different modes of endocytosis. Now, remember, uh, the talk will be primarily focused on the endocytosis aspect and not the exocytosis aspect. Uh, okay, so, so as I told you that uh, endocytosis is the process of taking in of things. And you can see here that this vesicle is called the endocytic vesicle. So we, I am reiterating because this will be important later that whenever the plasma membrane uh, needs to internalize something, it will form a pouch like structure called the endocytic vesicle, which is seen here. And how this vesicle forms, uh, sorry, how this pouch or endocytic vesicle or how this pouch forms actually differs from cell to cell and uh, the kind of things it is it wants to take in, etc. So based on uh, yeah, this is the endocytic vesicle. And based on how the pouch forms, uh, endocyt endocytosis can be broadly of two different kinds. One is called something called clathrin dependent, and some and another mechanism is called clathrin independent. So what is clathrin? So if you can look at this, you can see that it's like a huge mesh, mesh-like thing, and there are ball, uh, there are ball-like structures which are surrounded by a mesh. So these ball-like structures are actually this endocytic vesicle. If you look at it from behind, from here, if you look at it from here, you will see that uh, there is some uh, protrusion inside the cell, which now is surrounded by a mesh. So this mesh or this basket-like structure is made by a protein called clathrin. So what clathrin does is essentially it, it uh, you know, help it trick it, through mechanisms that I will explore later, I will talk about later, helps formation of this endocytic vesicle and help internalize the contents that are coming from outside. Okay, so if you don't have clathrin, it must mean a lot, I mean, a, not everything can depend on clathrin and in a cell for such an important process, it is always good to have backups. Like you and I will have backups for all our, uh, you know, most important data and most important anything. The cell also has backup mechanisms also uh, for a lot of reasons which we will talk about eventually so one of the mechanism is clathrin independent so these mechanisms of endocytosis are very similar but they are but the main difference is that they don't use clathrin as a way as a means to form this pouch or pit so one of them is called phagocytosis so again phago means food and cyto is a cell so this is the process by which the cell eats so phagocytosis, uh, so you can imagine uh, clathrin. So because clathrin now is a basket and you can see that it is, uh, and most of them are of similar sizes. You can see there are three of them and there are three of them are very similar in size. And also you can think that because this endocytic vesicle is covered by something very rigid, a basket, the its size will not be very flexible. So it can't be very large and very small depending on what, what it is trying to you know, take in. So that is when other mechanisms which do not use this restrictive mechanism come into play. And phagocytosis is one such mechanism where the cell can take in large particles because if, if they are very huge, 
then the cell uh, forms mechanisms wherein the plasma membrane itself will expand and you know internalize things that will come in so several uh, uh, parasites or so several tiny organisms actually feed uh, using such mechanisms another uh, way is by use of these bottle shaped or flask shaped pits these pits are called cavioli and so they are also uh, a ways to internalize a lot of material and their sizes also can vary a bit they are more flexible than the clathrin uh, pits that are formed and these cavioli also uh, do or also another way to internalize different uh, or uh, pathogens and different uh, lipids and the contents for the plasma membrane that you want to re the, uh, sorry that you want to recycle and reuse for later on okay so now we explored a mechanism in which the cell eats so there is another mechanism through which the cell drinks so anything that is fluid uh, and is very uh, liquidy can be taken in by the cell through a process called macropenocytosis this essentially means the process through which the cell drinks so you have a large membrane ruffles and these in, and they can internalize a lot more at once and so uh, uh, along with uh, certain kinds of fluids they can also internalize different particles that are present in the fluid so this is another way to internalize uh, smaller particles like viruses or any other nutrients that come from uh, external surfaces so ebola virus for instance uses this mechanism to enter the cell because it is not a uh, it it is a kind of it is a very long and you know filamentous like uh, virus so it can be easily internalized into the cell through macropenocytosis but uh, even though you have several kinds of mechanisms uh, and uh, viruses in particular hijack any hijack any of these four mechanisms that i've told you uh, but the most well studied mechanism of the lot is clathrin dependent endocytosis uh, and so let us focus on clathrin dependent endocytosis or any yeah, or internalization which depends on this basket like structure which is formed by clathrin okay so recapitulating what we know about plasma membrane so plasma membrane it contains different proteins that act as locks and you have different 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 uh, small carbohydrates and small sugars which are present in the exterior of the plasma membrane which act as sensors for anything that can bind to them so let us call them not uh, locks anymore let us call them by the technical name which is called a receptor so any of these uh, uh, so many of these proteins could be receptors what are, what does being a receptor mean it is essentially able to now receive anything that is coming to it so a lot of these proteins could be receptors so uh, one of the typical feature of clathrin mediated endocytosis or clathrin dependent uh, in the, uh, entry into the cell is the uh, is it's kind of a lock and key mechanism wherein if you have a receptor or a lock and if you have a, if you have any molecule that can bind to it which is which acts like a perfect key to the lock then this interaction will uh, is sufficient to uh, you know internalize whatever is binding to the receptor into the cell okay so uh, this is now a very simplistic childish version of what i uh, of clathrin mediated endocytosis and i have made this for clarity so now this blue stripe is the plasma membrane very small stretch of plasma membrane and we can think of these uh, these uh, stalks as receptors as you have seen earlier here is that these proteins actually go through the plasma membrane they have parts or uh, the protein parts are all are, are present on either ends of the plasma membrane you can see some jutting out and you can see some left behind inside of the cell so that is very similar to this there is a part of the protein that is outside of the cell and there is a part of the protein that is inside of the cell okay so now let's call this the lock or the receptor so once anything that is uh, from outside has uh, serves as a key so essentially there could be different proteins or different molecules which can actually fit into this lock uh, and can act as a key so uh, this interaction will then immediately be sensed by certain kinds of molecules which will aggregate these bound uh, lock and key or receptor and the key 
and eventually recruit uh, or call in or have clathrin molecules come to them so what these green things are doing essentially are sensing that the lock is now um, the lock has now met its key and now it's time to internalize the key along with the lock so for internalization as we have seen we need the formation of the pit and because this is clathrin dependent for the formation of the pit you need clathrin so these uh, green things act as an adapter uh, between the uh, lock and key and the clathrin okay so and eventually more and more receptors will get occupied and more and more uh, locks and keys will be sensed and more and more clathrin will come so if you know more and more clathrin will come then eventually they will keep forming the pit and then eventually you'll end up with a structure which is very similar to what we saw in the previous cartoon which is like uh, which is this is the endosomal vesicle which is formed so this is all good now you have clathrin this is the basket that is formed around it and now you have uh, all the receptor and its key uh, in inside it so uh, the only thing now you have to do is detach this from the plasma membrane right it can't stay stuck to the plasma membrane forever so i would assume that there would be something called uh, something to it the best thing you can imagine is to just cut it off right you can cut it you can snip it at this junction and this will be separate from the plasma membrane the cell also is very simple it also does the same so you have molecules that will just you know uh, tighten it and then eventually uh, uh, snip them such that this vesicle is now separate from the plasma membrane and is free in the cell so these kinds of molecules are called scissors and one example of such a molecule of a, of such a scissor is dynamin and uh, names are not important but this is a scissor that essentially snips these endocytic vesicles and separates them from the plasma membrane so now uh, this thing is now snipped and sealed and is sent into the inside of the cell so what you have now is the vesicle which contains the receptors with their keys which has been sensed and which also has clathrin around it eventually the sensors and the clathrin oops i forgot to remove the sensors the sensors and clathrin will eventually uh, be lost and as we have previously seen after they uh, are lost this vesicle is now targeted to different regions so when the first region that we saw where this vesicle will go to is the early endosome because that's the first thing that this vesicle encounters in summary this is a much smaller version and a more professional version of the same so this is a receptor at the plasma membrane this gray line is the plasma membrane this is the receptor and it interacts with its uh, key or the key comes and sits in it and the one of the adapters is uh, you don't need to bother with the names there is one adapter let's call it the pink molecule and what it does is essentially aggregates different kinds of receptors which have which are attached to their keys and eventually they also bring in clathrin and the coat forms and the vesicle is now ready to go wherever it can either go to it will typically go to early endosomes but it can go to other different regions as well okay so this is how uh, things are internalized so now you would as i told you before a lot of uh, pathogens especially viruses can hijack this mechanism so if uh, a report saw, uh, published not very long ago actually quite recently they talk uh, there is this is a huge exhaustive list you don't need to look at this i mean i give you more details so this is a list of uh, different kinds of coronaviruses which can which are actually found in different stages of the endocytosis pathway and you can see here that uh, these kinds of experiments are done on different kinds of cells so they've tried to infect different kinds of viruses on different kinds of cells to see what all mechanisms that a virus can take to get inside the cell and of particular note here will be the sars cov and the mers cov and the sars cov2 if you want this is the more zoomed in version of the same wherein you can see that different sars viruses the both both kinds of sars viruses are actually found in compartments which uh, are found in endosomal compartments they uh, because the sars cov is older and they have done exhaustive uh, exhaustive studies to actually show that the sars cov the virus which is responsible for sars can uh, so is internalized into the cell using clathrin dependent endocytosis 
and you can see that this kind of endocytosis uh, was done in one kind of a cell hep g2 some cells and if if you infect sars cov in another kind of cells which is hek29 e cells you can see that uh, now it can also use cavioli mediated endocytosis so what it tells you is that a virus is smarter than you are even though you have different mechanisms even the cell has a different uh, ways to internalize contents in them the virus can also suit itself to use more than one kind of mechanism uh, depending on what kind of cell it is infecting so especially with examples like these where you look at sars cov you will think that okay if 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 uh, if an organism has uh, uh, predominantly uses clathrin dependent endocytosis uh maybe it is more susceptible to sars and if an organism does not use clathrin dependent endocytosis but uses say cavioli mechanism then it won't be infected with sars but uh, but you can see here that sars cov can also use the cavioli mediated endocytosis so these viruses can hijack more than one mechanism and it all depends on the kind of protein that the viruses have and the kind of mechanism the cell offers and uh, how much uh, of these proteins can interact with what kinds of mechanisms that the cell offers for sars cov2 which is uh, the responsible for covid19 uh, it is not yet known whether it is uh, clathrin dependent endocytosis or if it uses other kinds of mechanism but it has been uh, seen in endosomal compartments or in compartments such as early endosome wherein uh, so which tells you that at least this molecule, this virus is using one of the endocytic mechanisms but we still don't know yet so this endo so all of these in the entire list all of these viruses are form uh, have been seen in the, one of these steps either in the endocytic vesicle or in the endosome or in the late endosome or you know in transition so that is how people identify that uh, the vir these viruses can use the endocytic machinery to get inside the cell and how do you, and with other kinds of tech, other kinds of experiments they came to know whether or not this endocytosis was dependent on clathrin or not okay so with this let's take a brief look at uh, a virus this virus is not sars cov2 this is sars cov2 so this is any general virus and you will see that viruses have a coat which has certain kinds of protein so these proteins in 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 uh, case of sars cov2 it's called the spike protein they are called the spike proteins so what do and these and these viruses use these coat proteins or these spike proteins as keys to bind to different kinds of receptors present on different cells so this is the uh, example of clathrin mediated endocytosis of a virus so if you can see here carefully you will notice that uh, the different proteins present on the virus are actually uh, sensed by can be bound to different kinds of receptors which are present on the plasma membrane so these spike proteins can actually act or these this uh, coat proteins or the proteins of the virus can actually act as uh, you know keys for different kinds of receptors on the plasma membrane so as we noticed earlier once this lock and key mechanism is established it is sensed by certain kinds of proteins which were earlier green in my cartoon are now brown here and then they will eventually recruit clathrin and once clathrin is also called in then eventually the endocytic vesicle is formed and dynamin that the the scissor protein will snip it off and then eventually this coat and the adapter is lost and this vesicle is sent to early endosome where now it can you know uh, replicate and the where it can get out of the endocytic machinery and go into the cell surface and then can replicate and make more of itself and this is just the internalization process so once it uh, comes out of this endosome and goes into the cell surface it can automatically obviously go back into the endocytic machinery and form a vesicle and go out of the cell through exocytosis but this is just one mechanism and it is thought that sars cov uses such kind of mechanisms however uh, there could be other mechanisms this first mechanism is a different way of representing what we previously saw this is the receptor this is the key and it is internalized this is the similar thing it's a different it's a cuter version of what we just saw however what we have to focus now is on the second kind of mechanism wherein you don't need an endosome but you need do definitely need a receptor so once the key and the receptor match the cell has the virus and the 
proteins around the cell and the lipid around the cell uh, around the virus can have mechanisms to just without endocytosis just let the virus into the cell so this kind of a mechanism is faster and uh, so it doesn't have to wait to go through the endocytic steps to actually be in the in the cell inside the cell so it can it will be compartment free so the replication will occur faster and it can actually uh, stay in the cell for much smaller time so the infection rates could be higher for such a kind of uh, uh, viral entry so one example of such a virus uh, is hiv which generally enters through such kind of a pathway okay so this random viruses apart what happens with sars cov 2 so sars cov 2 as i previously showed you also has different kinds of uh, proteins called as spike proteins these spike proteins are the keys and this uh, the receptor one of the receptor to this key is ace2 a stands for uh, angiotens angiotensin uh, converting enzyme 2 yeah angiotensin converting enzyme 2 and it can actually bind to the spike protein so once the uh, receptor and key attach Uh, I'll see. zoom. How do you zoom here? Well, that's the, that's the I can't zoom into this. I don't have that. It's an older. Mm. I don't have zoom. Yeah, it's an older version of PPT. So is it okay? So you can you let your imaginations run wild for people who can't see this. I'm sorry for that. Uh, so uh, so essentially the key the spike protein now interacts with ace2 which is the spike protein is the key and ace2 is the receptor so once it binds the endo the endocytosis is triggered and then it goes into the endosome and from the endosome the viral stress uh, takes out its rna and then it forms and it replicates and forms many more of itself and then goes out of the cell through exocytosis to infect other cells around it this was what we saw previously and this is what people think happens because of because of how sars cov 2 uh, mimics sars uh, mimics the sars cov because of uh, because both of them use the same kind of receptors and we know that sars cov actually uses such kind of mechanisms and also sars cov 2 was found in the endosomal compartment so we think uh, the guess is not too wrong another mechanism though as i told you was how other viruses uh, use our uh, direct entry into the cell which are faster and more infectious uh, sars cov 2 also uses such kind of mechanism so here in this case it actually has two uh, receptors one is another uh, some tmp rss2 you don't need to bother with the name it, it is another receptor which is uh, in addition to ace2 so once the virus actually binds to both these receptors the virus gains access into the cell uh, directly without endocytosis this is probably why it can infect more and the uh, uh, infectivity for this virus is higher okay so with this a lot of people are actually uh, trying to now uh, thinking about using endocytosis uh, targeting endocytosis as a mechanism to mechanism to get drugs to cure covid-19 or to block this virus entry or virus replication within the cell so let us take a uh, let us take a look at the different hypothetical situations that a pe that people can actually target potential targets for drugs the first one would be obviously to block ace2 ace2 receptor so if if all the locks are occupied with different keys so no new key can actually gain access right so you can have a drug which will block uh, which will occupy the free uh, which will occupy all the ace2 receptors so when the virus uh, when the cell is exposed to the virus it will not it will no longer have free ace2 to actually bind so internalization will not occur and then the cell the virus will not gain access into the cell another target you can use is to stop uh, uh, direct entry into the cell by blocking this other receptor of sars cov2 to as so as to prevent direct entry so uh, so if you use such kind of a drug to prevent direct entry then you can always rely on endocytosis to actually let the virus inside the cell so one of the uh, things that people have seen is that once the virus is in the endosome it has to come out right so uh, there are different kinds of enzymes that are activated in the endosome which will help the virus break free from the endosome and get into the cell 
uh, get, get out of the endosome and into the cell. So you can, uh, we can also target these kind of enzymes to stop the virus, to arrest the virus within the endosome so that it doesn't come out into the cell. So if it doesn't come out into the cells of uh, into the cell, then it will not be able to replicate. Uh, the other way is to, uh, is, so now you will be like, okay, fine. The virus has entered whatever for whatever reasons because we have two ways to enter. Maybe this is hard to target, but the virus has entered. However, to exit, the virus only has one route out, which is the exocytosis. So you can use different kinds of blockers for exocytosis and then get out. So currently, uh, this blocking of the other receptor, the Japan is trying to uh, see if such kind of mechanisms actually help to prevent uh, SARS-CoV-2 based in in uh, infections and entry into the cell. So yeah. But if you don't have all these mechanisms, you always have your detergent and the soap, which will through which you can always wash your hands and kill the virus without even bothering it to enter any of your uh, cells. So that is very important. So please remember to wash your hands and please remember to be safe at this hour. With this, I would like to take a little detour to talk about what kind of work that we do in the lab. Essentially, uh, our lab at TIFR much like Tom Sudoff is interested in looking at neurons. So this was the kind of work that Tom Sudoff has previously shown. He showed that this is one, this is the end of a neuron, and this is the other cell that the neuron is trying to communicate to. And there are tiny vesicles in the cell, like the endocytic vesicles that we spoke about. Uh, and these contain uh, material or information which has to be passed from one cell to the next cell. So uh, Tom Sudoff actually found out that these vesicles exocytose and then they release the content and which is sensed by the uh, next cell. So we are trying to study what kind of mechanisms go into uh, bringing these vesicles here where it actually has to re release content and what kind of mechanisms lead to formation of such vesicles, uh, which is at a place which is far removed from the site where it actually undergoes exocytosis to, remove, to release all these chemicals. So with that, I would like to thank you all. And this is the kind of stuff we do at Kaushika Lab. We look at different kind, transport of different kinds of things inside the cell using a tiny little worm called C. elegans. And thank you for your attention. And remember to wash your hands with no drugs and no cure. We, the best defense we have is to keep ourselves healthy and clean. So thank you. I'm open for questions. OK. Uh, question from Jane. So, I'll we'll take some questions from both from uh, Zoom and from Facebook. Yeah. And uh, let's start with some relatively simple uh, question, which is uh, let's take one from Zoom right now. So, you started off at the beginning by saying that. Uh, let's see, this question. Uh, yeah, do animal cells other than neurons communicate with each other? Yes, a lot of cells communicate like uh, a so <clears throat> you can have those kidney cells, other cells which produce hormones. Those are also the cells which communicate with much larger population of cells because hormones and other things need to be secreted out of the cell and received by other cells. And so, yeah, a lot of cells communicate with one another different forms. So this form of, so this entire pathway that I described to you, which is clathrin dependent, which actually internalizes things and releases them. It's called the secretory pathway because the cells. Okay, make your window a little bigger now. Yeah. So this is actually called the secretory pathway, which in which the cells, you know, secrete things outside. So these kind of uh, mechanisms are widely known in different cells, cell types, especially the ones which need to push things out of them. Okay, and uh, let's continue uh, with a completely different kind of question. This is looking at your last slide. Okay. This is something which has been in the news. Why can't we take detergents internally and <laughs> tackle the virus? Why is it only for washing hands? Should we be <laughs> drinking detergents? So uh, you can't take detergents because as I told you, plasma membrane and other things have proteins on them. So even in the labs, when we want to break open the cells and destroy the proteins and uh, break open, <laughs> destroy the protein component that make the plasma membrane, we use detergents, different kinds of detergents. We don't use RIN, but we use different kinds of detergents. So you don't want to break up your own cells. You want to actually target the virus and 
yeah, so taking in detergent is probably a bad idea. Actually, it's not probably, it is a bad idea. Okay, let's join, uh, let's, uh, let's take a question from uh, Facebook. Uh, there is a question saying, how does the cell decide what to take in? Okay, so again, uh, it all depends on what kind. So the receptors that are present on the cell surface, they are there. They are actually like those people who wait for to wait to receive people at airports. So they have this card. They are those card carrying people. So they will say, oh, no, I want this. So I will wait for this person to come arrive and then I will take them to wherever they want to. So these receptors are actually kind of those card carrying people who wait for the right material to come their way and then take them in. So it actually it depends on the cell. Uh, what the cell needs for its function and what the cell, uh, yeah, for the cell needs for its function, it will make a card carrying person and put it up at the plasma membrane and say, Agar ye aaya, to hum lenge. And those kinds of cells will also be at a place where they are expected to, you know, receive these kinds of keys for the receptors. Okay, another question. Uh, do clathrin deposits in deficient cells use other pathways for? virus entry in the cell since most viral entry is receptor mediated uh yeah as i told you ebola virus uh, for instance does uh, is in, in, in uptaken by uh, macrophenocytosis it's a long filamentous virus and uh, there is i don't there is i think two ligands which are known for even though it can bind to ligands, it does not necessarily mean it will trigger clathrin mediated endocytosis. So different kinds of receptors, uh, uh, so so, sorry, not ligands, receptors. So different kinds of receptor, there are different receptors which will which trigger uh, clathrin mediated endocytosis, and there are many other ligands which don't trigger clathrin mediated endocytosis. For uh, Ebola, the receptors it's bind, by, it binds to do not trigger clathrin mediated endocytosis. However, they trigger macrophenocytosis. For, I think, herpes simplex virus, just there is another virus, I forget the name right now. It can bind to four receptors. It requires four receptors. And two of those receptors are receptors for cavioli mediated endo endocytosis. So it, it all depends on what kind of protein the virus actually carries on itself. And yeah. So because of that, it can use multiple kinds of mechanisms. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, let's look at another question from Zoom, uh, which says, these pictures you've shown, how much time does it take for a virus to enter the cell once it is near the membrane uh, and get in? And similarly, how much time does these processes of endocytosis or take place? Endocytosis take? So endocytosis, so it takes around 15 to 20 minutes for the end. Uh, so when the when the uh, when the clathrin mediated uh, uh, endocytosis is triggered, it takes some two to three minutes depend. So typically it's around three minutes, but it can take larger uh, amount of time if if you have many more uh, receptors that are coming in. So typically around three to six minutes. But uh, from there to enter the endosome, it takes about 20 ish minutes. And from there to go early endosome, and from there to go to late endosomes or lysosomes, it will take again 20 to 30 minutes more. So you can think about it as once it gains access to the cell, maybe an hour and a half is when it will be in a lysosome from inside it. Uh, an hour to hour and a half is when you can expect it to be in the lysosome. But most viruses escape this machinery before they enter the lysosome. So some 45, 30 to 45 minutes. Okay, here's the next question. What is the actual function of the ACE2 receptor on our cells? Uh, clearly it was not designed to recognize SARS-CoV-2. So what does it really do? So ACE, -co ACE receptor is a receptor for, as it says, angiotensin, con angiotensin converting enzyme. So angiotensin converting enzyme is uh, for this renal angio angiotensin system. And it does, uh, I'm not really sure what it does. It does a lot of functions which uh, are definitely not viral uptake. Does anybody here know what it does? I'm sorry, I forget what renal. Uh, it's it's a part of the RAS system. Uh, essentially, yeah. Yes, it regulates blood pressure and other things. Sorry. 
yes apparently it regulates regulates blood pressure by regulating the volume of fluids in the body uh, so because kidney uh, you know that it is a tissue which uh, metabolizes and forms urine and deals with a lot of fluid intake and fluid volumes so angiotensin uh, converting enzyme does that help regulate blood pressure thanks vidur okay you gives a question again uh, you said that the uh, uh what the, the endosomal ph mm -hmm. is important in deciding this process so can you modify the endosomal ph to kill a virus so endosomal ph i don't think externally can be uh, modified if it can be i am not aware of those studies uh so endosomal so different kinds of again as i said different kinds of viruses how much of a how much of a what kinds of ph ranges can a virus tolerate is very specific to the virus which is why i said some viruses escape this endosomal system from at early endosome and some escape it at late endosomes so the idea is that the endosomal compartment uh, compartments continue to get more and more acidic as uh, from the point of time they, that they are formed so early endosomes are probably the least acidic compartment whereas lysosomes are very acidic they are around 4 to 5 in ph so some uh, viruses escape this system before so it all depends on how much uh, what kind of ph triggers the viral exit from the endocytic uh, system so yeah Facebook, why COVID-19 is happening uh, in OT? Wait, wait, wait. Before that, I'll ask, uh, continue. I got another point for the previous question. Uh, can you just repeat the question again? Yeah, the question was, can you control the endosomal pH and to, uh, yeah. So there are ways to do that. You can probably do genetic manipulations and other kinds of drugs to stop the endosomal pH. uh from getting worse so what pe what people are actually also trying to for non virus related stuff what people have tried to do is block the maturation of uh, early endosome into late endosome so if you prevent the conversion of these kinds of endosomes from one to another you will obviously block their ph changes so you can block this virus at a non conducive state a non conducive ph compartment so that it doesn't get out of the cell that can be done maybe yeah sorry there was a question uh, there is another question which is uh, do all cells have similar processes and does the virus affect all cells similarly so uh, so why so the question is do all cells have similar processes and do viruses affect all cells similarly so as i told you that uh, different kind of so the specificity for infections so there are several kinds of viruses which you will say that oh it only affects rats so it only affects uh, bats or only it affects you know humans i wanted to say cats but okay only humans so that kind of specificity also comes from what kind of uh, keys do these viruses have so if the keys that these vi these viruses possess are two receptors which are specific to the organism for instance say it is supposed to specific to a protein that is you know only found in a cells of a cat and not us then definitely and if the virus only possesses the key to that particular protein then it can't affect us so it is very dependent on what kind of uh, uh, machinery that these viruses have so a lot of so a lot of uh, these viruses can actually you know uh, have multiple multiple interactions with the cell surface so a lot of these viruses do not directly read the key uh, uh, the receptor they read the sugars and carbohydrate moieties which are present on the outside of the plasma membrane so those are largely don't, they, they don't largely change with the with hum it be among human they will not be very different but they can be different among different species so that also can play a role in it so yeah. there is actually a related question is that why uh covid 19 happens for example in cats and not dogs and things like this i don't know <laughs> i don't know i would assume cats and dogs to have ace2 receptors yeah i don't know okay uh, any questions from facebook uh, there's one which is <laughs> does the immune system check what the cell has endocytosed and on the basis of that react yes the question is a good question uh, the question is does the immune system check uh, whether the cell, what the cell has endocytosed or not so for the immune system to check what the cell has endocytosed so immune system works by reading what is present on the surface of the cell 
so after exocytosis if there is a residual after exocytosis when the cell virus is outside is then the immune system can actually uh, read it so using endocytosis and especially mechanisms which do not use endocytosis for viral entry these are uh, ways to you know escape the immune system or essentially stall the immune system until they have undergone at least one round of replication so uh, that is also why a uh, lot of viruses are known to actually that is also thought of why a lot of viruses use endocytic mechanisms to gain access to the cell yeah and if if you have mechanisms which do not involve endocytosis and direct entry so those will be faster so the those viruses can infect more uh, and infect many cells before the immune system catches up with them okay uh, this is a follow up on a question since you talked about ace2 mm -hmm. and talking that is it possible that drugs which may block that uh, will block normal body function of course well they might and has caused hence be cause side effects etc yeah which is why which is why a lot of all for all these drugs people generally do clinical trials and which is why a lot of laboratory work goes into developing any drug because people have to see that you taking a drug will not affect your bodily functions and it only affects the viral entry which is why it, it takes times to time to develop all these kinds of drugs okay questions any other uh, there's one question where exactly is this ace2 present is it in the throat cells and that's why we get coughs where is the ace2 receptors present is it in only the throat cells and that is why you get cough so previously ace2 was known to be only present in some muscle and some other kinds of cells but recently recent reports after the sars virus people have uh, seen that there is a lot of uh, ace2 receptor present on the lung cells cells of the lungs which is why i think the lungs are more susceptible for this kind of infection through ace2 receptors on the epithelial cells of the lungs to be precise uh here's another question from zoom so instead of the ace2 receptor is it possible to break off the spike protein on the virus uh, which was the key to the ace2 to stop its entry so it is not unless you artificially make the spike protein i don't think so uh you can do that yeah i don't think so you'll have to artificially engineer a virus which is devoid of its spike protein that means you have to genetically manipulate its rna and if it yeah so naturally occurring viruses it's hard to do so uh how does the immune system <laughs> prevent of the virus from infecting cells does it block the key yeah uh, no the what immune the immune system essentially uh, reads the key that is present on the viruses and then devises antibodies or fighting uh, devises an army against that and once the army is launched it will break it down and destroy it that is what it does it senses the it makes a custom made army for the key that is what it does but is this happening outside the cell or inside the cell This is this happening is the virus outside the cell not after it has been taken in yes yes the uh, the question is where is, where is the army forming and where is the attack happening it is outside the cell which is why uh, the mechanisms to endocytosis uh, are better because they give time for the virus to replicate enough number of times before the Im immune system catches up and is this a related question yeah does plasma therapy have anything to do with this process of uh, endocytosis yeah. so the question is does plasma therapy has anything to do with endocytosis i assume the uh, the confusion comes because of plasma membrane and plasma therapy but this is not true plasma therapy is a plasma is a component of the blood so if you uh, and blood uh, contains these antibodies or the armies against the virus that are generated uh, that infects the cell so when you uh, transfuse or when you supplement a person with the plasma you are essentially supplementing the army which is preformed army so it will be again outside the cell okay, there's a question on uh, what are cytokines and uh, <laughs> Do these have anything to do with this immune system and viruses and endocytes? 
Yeah, I mean, the cytokines are uh, chemicals which also, you know, are part of this army. They, um, yeah, so they are part of the immune system. They, yeah, I'm not really sure what they do, but <laughs> they are part of the immune system. And uh, this, this sense, no, Vidur? <laughs> huh. Just a minute. <laughs> Immune immune system is not my forte, guys. Oh, cytokines are the chemicals which are uh, secreted by the cells of the immune system, which affect other kind of cells or the target thing, or target molecule. So cytokines are one of them. So essentially, they are the messengers for the immune system, if not part of the army, I would say. Okay, Please ask questions, questions more related to cell biology. To the, yeah, cell biology. I mean, today, which is not how stuff <laughs> enters the cell. Thank you. Uh, we are not clinicians. We should say this. We are not working on the virus. We are not biologists or clinicians. We are just looking at basic <laughs> biology, how stuff enters the cell. Thank you, Arnav. <laughs> okay, are there two more questions? Whether you are following the Facebook feed, can you? Yeah. So uh, there's one more question, which is. Uh, once endocytos, you told that uh, the vesicle is covered by a cage, but since it's caged and it's like in a prison, how does the virus actually escape that cage or prison? Okay, so first of all, the cage is lost. I am right on that slide. So once this vesicle is endocytos, the cage is lost, but still the virus is trapped inside the endosome. So that is when I said, so once, even once since it's in the endosome, if the there are certain uh, as and when the uh, virus goes into more and further uh, along the endocytic process there could be uh, uh, different enzymes which will help break open this endosome help the virus break open this endosome and get free for instance for SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV this enzyme is called L-cathepsin which is present as early as early endosomes and late endosomes. It's actually also a lysosomal protein. So they, these, this enzyme helps the act, it helps activate the spike protein, which is inside the endosome, spike protein of the virus, which is inside the endosome, and help it break free and get into the cell, free of the endocytic system. And uh, does the virus uh, go to the nucleus where it proliferates? Or is that happening within the cell outside the nucleus? Does the virus uh, go into the nucleus, or does it happen? Does the, or does it proliferate within the within the rest of the cell, outside the nucleus? So the virus uh, replicates outside the nucleus. So it makes its own RNA reading enzymes, uh, and it can make copies of that. And the proteins will be formed in there, and then they are uh, caged in the endosome-like structures, and then they are assembled in the cell, and then it is exocytosis out. So it all happens in the non-nucleus area of the cell, which okay, is the cytosol. Here is a question, uh, which this might be a silly question, but maybe for the virus you need this receptor, but what about for regular things that the cell needs like food or things, are those also going in via receptors? So the receptors, uh, the question is, do you need the receptor? Do, do you need the receptor only for viruses or do or does the cell not naturally need receptors for other purposes? So the when I say that these pathogens hijack this mechanism, they mimic the natural uh, substance for the receptor. So the receptors are there, as I told you, to receive things that the cell already needs. So they are like the people, the card holding people at the airport waiting to receive the people they intend to receive. So these receptors are put by the cell not to get invaded, but to you know internalize the things it actually needs. So viruses uh, mimic these substances that can, that should or naturally bind to the receptor and then gain access to inside of the cell through a uh, mechanism which was not meant for them, but for other things that, that the cell needs. For instance, a lot of viruses uh, hijack uh, the endocytosis mechanism, endocytosis system through binding through the LDL receptor. LDL is the low density lipoprotein. So essentially, this, the, these kind of uh, receptors are there for, you know, uh, uh, fatty acid transfers and other kinds of uh, cellular requirements and processes. So 
Yeah. Uh, there is one more question. Can neurosynaptic transmission be an analog of how virus entry occurs into a host cell? Can you please repeat the question? The question is, can neurosynaptic transmission be an analog to how virus enters the host cell? So if you mean analog to how, if you mean, uh, in the further, if the process of exocytosis and endocytosis is comparable, it is of course comparable uh, because the chemicals that are uh, the chemicals that are released from the neuron uh, to the general area, which are to be sensed by the following cell, which can be the neuron or a muscle, can are also sensed through receptors. So, for instance, if a neurotrans neurotransmitter are the, are the chemicals that are the, that the neurons secrete, and there are different kinds of it. So, and depending on what kind of neurotransmitter a neuron ca carries, the next cell will have receptors to actually bind to them or receive them. So, yeah, it is similar in that way. Okay, so you said that the virus hijacks the pathway. Uh, could you tell us in short what is the mechanism between this mimicry? How does the virus design something to hijack this pathway? So, uh, so viruses are creatures which can't replicate outside a host. So uh, they are evolved to use an, a pre-existing cell to enter. So it is very likely that uh, as and when different proteins evolve, the viruses also evolved uh, uh, similar kinds of proteins which are similar in shape. So a lot of these interactions between uh, receptor and uh, its key happens because you can think of it as uh, uh, getting lodged into a particular shape. So if this is the receptor and if this is your key, then it will get lodged into it. But if you have a key which is like this, it will not get lodged into it. So having a protein that can actually fit into the lock is important. It doesn't ha it doesn't necessarily have to be the exact uh, key, but as long as it can fit in the groove, uh, as long as it can, you know, bind to the receptor, it should be fine. So the viruses probably viruses evolve along with their host cells uh, to get make proteins which are similar and make it easier for them to hijack uh, these kind of receptors bind to receptors okay a question from facebook is it actually possible to visualize the viral entry process using light cell imaging techniques and if so how is this done so the question is is it possible to visualize the viral entry process through light cell imaging and how is it done so the early, most uh, the earlier exper the earliest experiments where people actually saw virus entry through endocytosis was to look at electron microscopy, and that is why that is how they could see that there are clathrin uh, baskets and all. So with uh, the advent of you know light microscope, you can always look at uh, what uh, and fluorescence microscope, you can always look at what is happening and what where is going. So these kind of uh, experiments that people do. They make, uh, they make, uh, they duplicate the uh, spike protein and other kinds of proteins of the virus in the lab. They genetically engineer them so that they fluoresce under different kind of light, and then they try to infect. So here, if you see this, this in this table, I showed you that different kinds of viral infections uh, were seen in different kinds of cells. So what they're essentially seeing is not just the virus per se, but they are actually also looking at uh, the protein of the virus that is required that the spike protein for instance in the, in the case of SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2 they genetically in, uh, make these proteins fluoresce and then they track it in the under microscope and see where all it goes so you can track it and you can use several uh, kinds of fluorescent labelings to separately label the virus protein and different kinds of endosomal compartments and clathrin and then you can see uh, where all of them are present and such kind of studies are, are possible to do and are being done also so so does the viral genome integrate into the cell's genome no viral gene uh, the question is if viral viral genome integrates into the cell's genome not for the SARS one, SARS, no, it does not integrate into the cell's genome. As I told you that most of these replications occur in the non-nuclear part of the cell. So the nucleus itself has a membrane and the cell's DNA is present in the nucleus. So this happens outside 
and it is anyway if for most rna viruses uh, they are rna and the uh, host cell is probably is most likely dna so no and this uh, the replication happens outside the nucleus so less likely if there are any cases like that i'm not aware but for the ones i'm talking about for today uh, sars cov2 and sars cov no Let's see if there are more questions. Yes, book. Right on the table. Arnab, it's twelve ten. It's twelve ten. Can we end? So there's a clarification sort. Yeah. Uh, the virus replication is not inside the nucleus yeah the the clarification is if the virus replication is inside the nucleus the answer is no it's not, not inside the nucleus i can show you that slide if you will here there is no nucleus this is the endoplasmic reticulum and not the nucleus it's outside Okay, there's a question uh, which says that we have heard of new kinds of symptoms for COVID-19. Is it because that it, the virus is going to new organs which have the AC2 receptor other than respiratory tissues? So the question is, are the new symptoms of COVID-19 uh, because uh, of the virus infecting other kinds of cells which have AC2 receptors? I am not sure. I don't know. And do these viral proteins could they cause epigenetic changes in the host? Could the viral proteins cause epigenetic changes in the host? So epigenetic changes. So virus generally forms what more three or four kinds of proteins, the like capsid protein, the nucleo, uh, the proteins which bind to the genetic material. So no, less likely because for epigenetic changes to happen, it should have, uh, it should be able to. It, it, it has to have different kinds of functions, which the viral genome probably does not encode for. Does this, uh, there's a, another question. Uh, does this process necessarily kill the cell or can the cell survive after proliferating the virus? Oh, the, uh, the, the question is whether the uh, viral replication process kills the cell. No, the viral replication process does not kill the cell because endocytosis and exocytosis is the mechanism which keeps the cell alive and the virus hijacks it so that it can you know keep infecting so if the replication continues and the particles are being released and they infect more and more other cells it does not kill the cell okay. so are there any more questions on facebook or on zoom no on twitter let's check Okay, uh, there's one more last question then. Uh, what exactly is the problem if the virus isn't killing the cell? Then what leads to all the deterioration of conditions of patients and like what's the cause behind all of the symptoms if the virus doesn't directly kill the cells? So the question is what is the cause of the symptoms if the virus doesn't necessarily kill the cell? So uh, it I don't know, but I can think that it is probably because it blocks uh, the receptors and it impedes the function of the receptor. So ACE2, ACE2 receptor probably is present in the lungs for to serve a particular purpose. And if you don't have the receptor for what it actually is needed for, then it can have detrimental effects to the cell. This is in lines with the question that previously people asked whether the drugs that can target ACE2 receptor, do they have physiological, uh, do they have, do they have, can they affect the human? They will definitely do because the purpose that the receptor is, is to solve uh, wherever it is, is not solving. So it could be a consequence of that. Okay, question from Zoom. 
do these viruses also show quorum sensing so quorum sensing i've only ever heard in the the question is do these viruses show quorum sensing and i've only ever heard of quorum sensing in the in, for bacteria when they uh, secrete uh, chemicals like cyclic amp where the different bacteria can form sheets i don't i'm not aware of any quorum sensing mechanisms for viruses so i'm thinking no okay uh maybe this has been answered before but it's come again how does a virus make the membrane leaky oh the membrane uh, so essentially that is what we have discussed here so if you can think of this receptor as something which is present on the virus suppose think of this as the ace2 receptor for instance and this is the spike protein when it binds so the membrane is not leaky so when i told you that uh, when this kind of an endocytic vesicle is formed and is eventually pinched off so with the pinching process immediately begins the repair process to seal in the hole so the membrane is never leaky so if you uh, so with the amount of endocytosis and exocytosis that happens in the cell if they create leaks like that the cell will probably die because the material will flow out of the cell so immediately there are mechanisms in place that will patch the reseal the cell and the when i wait, i'll showed you dynamin as well right uh, the protein which can this cision molecule when it uh, snips it snips when it actually narrows the neck it continues to the narrows the neck uh, neck until the point that these two membranes are in very close contact so then it snips so because they are in so 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 such proximity or in such a close contact the resealing is uh, easier to do and happens fairly quickly so it doesn't directly snip when the neck is quite wide it actually narrows the neck first it it's like a rope that tightens around the neck it tightens it and then snips it yeah can you bring me up on the screen somehow Okay, uh, it looks like there are no more questions on this. So, uh, with this, we'd like to thank uh, Shanti for uh, taking us to this world of endocytosis and how stuff enters cells and our uh, mechanism being taken over by uh, viruses like the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, we will continue our regular Chai and Y series, typically in summer, uh, from mid-May onwards. Our sessions, at least when they were physical sessions. Uh, used to be the hands-on vacation special sessions. Uh, we will try and do something on those lines. So the next session, maybe we will have something where you can actually join us as we do uh, the Chai and Y session here with some simple experiments to be done at home. So that's going to be coming up uh, two weeks from now uh, at a screen near you. Uh, till the lockdown is over, we will have to be in this online mode. So do uh, and spread the word, and you can check out some of our older videos. on our facebook page or on our youtube channel as well so uh, with that uh, uh, we will uh, end this session thanks a lot shravanti and see you again till then stay safe and keep yourself at home wash your hands as she said and don't allow that virus in see you later